Hi, uh, welcome back to the second part in this series. In the first video, we created a USD orientated around the modeling department where we created two variants like default and a damaged. Um, and we assigned some temporary materials from within that department for the occlusion based rendering for the XPU renderer and the CPU render. And we also included some LODs. So we're going to pick up where we left off and I'm going to kind of create, I've created a brand new scene which lives under look dev asset and then the name of the asset and asset and we're on version three. So we're going to bring in the model. So this is our model. And if you remember, we do have, I hope you can see the desktops clearly, but you can see it's set to damage load one and we can kind of pick up now and change the variant in here so we could change the geometry variant to any LOD or to any variant default LOD 1 to 4 or we could change the shader and things like that and if we render this um, right now it'll render the XPU well I'm rendering with the kind of the standard render settings without the ones that are built in if you hit D here you will see that there are some render settings here and I'm kind of using these in the viewport very quickly just to make sure everything's coming in okay. Uh, and you can see that's that's working. There's no lights or anything at this point. It's just a very generic representation of your model rendered via these render settings here. So just hitting D on the keyboard there. These are just temporary. You can configure these if it kind of enables depth of field by default. I don't want that and I turn off motion blur. And I usually turn off denoising just when I'm doing temporary things, just so I can look exclusively at the model here. So you can kind of see that. So what I'm going to do in this, I'll just do a quick overview. I'm going to assign a material to both a material that will work both on, on both geometry variants, the default and the, the damaged. Um, and I'm not going to use the component builder just yet, but I'm going to create three main materials and then I'm going to loop through a bunch of texture sets and assign variant for every texture set I see. So, well, let me explain a little bit more clearly. Within the project structure here, this is my project structure. I keep things like textures under assets and I have a texture folder specific for this particular model called Aquabot. And then I've created in Painter textures for each variant. And I've created a folder here like so. So I've got three blue, three red, and three yellow. And what I intend to do is cycle, have one shader that represents the blue and cycle through three times to assign three variants. So Essentially what we'll end up with, and I'll just quickly jump to the bottom, is the ability to see in the materials the three blue, the three red, and the three yellow, so we can choose between those. Okay. So that's kind of what we're going to do, and then we're going to publish this so we have a brand new USD asset. So this is the network. Let's dive in. So we've imported the asset as a subnet here and I'm literally just pointing to my USD database here so there's a, a dollar USD which is actually if I just remove that it's just pointing to my OneDrive to the global USD asset location here like so and then the asset name here if I middle click again is referring to the word Aquabot and that is actually being declared further up stream in this node we talked about briefly. So it's basically asset name here, Aquabot. And I have a bunch of other variables that I often use, and that can change depending on the project. And I can you can add as many as you want, change that. So that's pretty much where you might see this dollar asset name keep kicking in. And I think it's just a nice way of making that completely now procedural. So it's 
you don't have to remember the name you can just rely on it being changed once and your entire system can be using the same variable so before we get started we need to assign to keep this simple we need to assign some materials um, so what I've done here is I've created a material library and I've created the let's just make sure everything is correct I've created the material path prefix here to be authored down here under the material group here so we can have the modeling materials and the look dev materials here so you'll see that we have the three blue red and yellow materials then we have some other materials in here again which are optional uh, and they are for like the let me fire a render off and show you but um let me actually just point to one of these it should still work they're for the emissive um pieces of geometry that i want to take and override the textures so there is an emissive texture which i'll show you quickly in painter so these these neon lights here they, they they have a shader called neon and i'm just basically creating a very simple material x neon shader just wait for this to start rendering properly and you'll see there's some boosters as well and i'm just it's actually called emit it's not very well named but there's a, an emissive texture here there you go um called emit and i'll go through this in a little while i'll go through all of this and then the led is probably the little sphere that's down here so i chose to just override the geometry with a new material even though if i didn't use these this would actually have emissive materials underneath as texture maps so so we first need materials as i just mentioned so that's how I've brought the material library in. So it kind of keeps it with the asset nice and organized in this case for it works for me. So I bring it in here and you've got the materials and you've got blue, red and yellow. Now they're, they're identical and this is a digital asset that I've made. So I'll just open this up and show you what's inside. It's very simple. So it's a material x standard surface shader like so and we're bringing in the diffuse and we set this to these texture maps are all from substance painter and they're all in aces cg color space so for this to read incorrectly um i'm bringing this in as vector 3 because i'm actually loading a converted exr file as a wrapped file and i'll talk about that in just a second but we'll just do a quick overview of the shader so we're bringing in the standard PBR materials. We've got met <clears throat> metalness, metallic, then we've got roughness, and we've got the emission. And then I've created a color correct here so I could cycle through the hue if I wanted to do something fun with that, and we can promote that and the saturation. Um, it's not a complete shader. It's very basic, and it's just producing the look I want. It doesn't have subsurface. It doesn't have layering. It's very simple for now. It's just... We just want to basically bring in exactly what Substance Painter um, expects us to assign to our shader to have a one-to-one -one visualization of what we see in Substance Painter. So what we see here, um, what we export from here, gets completely remapped into this Material X shader correctly. So then we have the normal map here. And again, the normal map is set vector 3. The emissive is vector 4. Roughness is well float, it's technically raw data, I guess. And same for the metallic. And the height is also float. So we have a dis displacement on here as well. And then I've also added here a USD material preview shader so that it just pre previews correctly in the viewport, which you may have seen earlier. Um, and that's actually pointing to the EXR files that I had. And you may notice every one of my texture maps is UDIM driven as well so it can this syntax here can actually load several UMD, UDIM tiles <clears throat> onto the model all in one go so that's very handy 
and then the preview usd preview shader just goes into this kind of i was going to say collects node but it's now called the material outputs and aovs so that kind of is this and that's all we're doing now i'm promoting a few things from within here so i'll just jump up and i am promoting a bunch of parameters from the paths and from some of the settings here and this will change over time i guess so down here we are applying all the map and i've just promoted a few parameters here that i might want to change like emissive the actual value of the emissive and stuff i actually haven't changed anything because the actual kind of look dev and the shader balancing was all done right within substance um painter so once you're happy with this you pretty much can get the same results directly out in houdini via this material x standard shader but they're there just in case the important thing really is that the i provide a path for the usd preview material and again we've got this dollar job assets textures assets name and then variant and this is just referring to this here so this is basically i could write in variants name of the folder and it would go and find it on disk if i just resolve this path completely you'll see it's going all the way down to this base color default which if i jump over to it just ignore the script on the left at the moment you, this is where my textures are living so they're living here like so but the shader is actually referring to rats and we'll talk about that in just a second so this is a nice way of just writing in something like would write down here default blue in here and the whole thing would pick up that folder i'm actually using the op name and i'm using a variable that's looping through so it's going to loop through this in a loop and be 0 1 2 and 3 so i can just pick up this variable and propagate it throughout the inputs here you may notice the resolution i can change the resolution again there is a resolution channel here which refers to this and i can change my resolution so we'll talk about this in more detail in just a second so the substance painter file i provided i can just jump up here I provided one texture at 4k even though i'm viewing here at 2k this is a non-destructive workflow so i could view this at 512 but my document is actually 4k in this case so it would actually and it's much more interactive to texture at 2k and then when you export just set it to 4k so when i export this i've created a very similar to the standard one, the um, PBR metallic roughness. It is actually this one copied, and I've I've created this one here called PBR metallic roughness Houdini, and it's my own copy. And you'll see I've created the variable called project. So this means the path, the name will be called default yellow O one. And then the base color and then default yellow or one again so the textures will be named like this so i'm creating the base color the roughness metallic emissive height normal an ambient occlusion for the modeling department as you saw earlier and a mask so that mask is pretty much um the paintwork here so if i want to change the paintwork color later like uh, if i want to cycle this through a hue color correct i could so this is just a little last minute change I did. So let me see if I can find my custom mask. So that's my custom mask. So I could now drive the color of the paintwork here and, and cycle through and have different with, I could have different um, hue variations here or something. So it's not actually used in this project, but it's just something I'm planning on doing as well later on. I'll just go back to the export textures. When I export the textures, I make sure I'm choosing the correct configuration, which would be this one I've created here. Just maximize that a little bit. 
like so. And you can see it's going to export all the different tiles, I guess, for all the different um, materials like diffuse and AOVs or something like that. I don't know really what we call this, but it's just going to export a set of textures at 4K in Aces Color Space. So we would save this file and then I would hit export and that would go to disk like so. It'd be like default yellow 01 and that would be there. And then it would go inside and create these subfolders. So it would go inside and create, I think we were actually accidentally in the wrap files, but it would create, originally it would create the default yellow 01, for example, here. And it would just create these named folders like that. So I'm just being very specific about the naming here because sometimes Houdini converts these to rats and when you save this as, an, um, as a USD you can choose to gather the input textures and localize them. They'll get copied from your source destination which is this location and sent over to your USD location which may be in a different place and it just dumps them all in the same folder and if they're named the same Houdini will auto rename them but it's very difficult to to find your textures later on uh, and I will demonstrate this again <laughs> if this makes no sense there's a lot of sub layering to this explanation so I do apologize um, but essentially we have some fun now we've got the scene file save as version 2 and then we <clears throat> we say we want another yellow variant so I go down here and I change the the wear level or something on here that I did. So you could just hit random, and this will randomize. Um, see these scratches and things like that. Just a very, it's just a smart material, and any professional texture artist will be looking at this, going, "Oh, that's just a smart material," and it is. But it's just a concept. So it's like if you know a little bit of substance painter, it can go a long way, and it can kind of help you put a lick of paint on your model. It can help you test out different colors and just have different variations as well. So we could bump up the wear and it's going to basically chip away a little bit more. We can take off the stickers and things like that. So I've added some rust in here, which you can see these bits here. I can just switch that off and it'll clean it up. And we now have a slightly different variant, I guess. Uh, we could change this to red and we have a different variant. So this is very texture based driven it's not a procedural shading we can totally do a video series where we make this completely in houdini uh, and do a procedural texture completely as well but i'm sidetracking here so when we when we're happy with this particular version we'd save this the actual um substance file as default yellow 02 so you would have a, a master scene then you would save it as default yellow 02 and when you export the file would go right down to here it would just be created and you have another folder here so that's what i'm doing here in houdini is i've decided to create a generic master kind of shader that will take the um, iteration value of one to three and just assign a material variant for each iteration so this mat plus one is just saying this variable is an iteration value from within a loop plus one iteration starts at zero my naming convention in substance is default yellow 010203 so this just gives this a plus zero one um, and i use the word up name to go up and you will see it's just named after this so if this was called anything else it would break so it's just um, a bit more of a procedural approach i guess so that's kind of what happens in in this network here. So these here, there is a little bit of VEX code again, and you'll notice down here, I've created a a value options name, which I'm iterating through. Basically, three I'm iterate doing three iterations of this loop, so it's going to iterate through this process three times for each one. So that's why we will get the default blue variant name is going to be named 
after what's coming in so the variants get named after the very last node as well so this would be normally just default blue but i've appended this with the iteration value plus one to stop it from being default blue underscore zero zero it's now going to be default blue underscore zero one iteration two would be zero two and then you know zero three so you essentially do get that um iteration going through and i thought that was quite cool it took a while to kind of set that up but i guess once it's in place you can kind of quickly iterate through your substance painter variants so the blue catalog zero one to two to three sorry like so so you get this this is just accessing the neon shader which is this tube here and all i'm doing is randomizing for every three of these just the emissive color so i'm just cycling through a random color it's not essential and it will probably get overwritten by me later on in lighting but i was just testing how to access and randomize things it may be useful to you it may not be so that's all that these are doing so there's just a different seed for each one so we assign the materials here like so and this is assigning the materials to the model so this is my hierarchy that was created in the modeling department here like so and i've basically i call everything geo that's geometry and anything that's hopefully a light has got a um lgt naming convention on there as well so i assign all the shaders and you can see materials if i can pull this together a little bit more so you can see the default yellow is being assigned and this is the entire so it, well we should probably just do one but you can see this has been assigned to all the relevant places and you can see the viewport updates because of the usd material preview surface it's actually even previewing the emit shader in here so what's happening here is we are basically this this is going to be very specific to your model and things like that but i'm just assigning anything in here with the map, map basically the uh, it's called body details mat and i'm assigning that here and then um, i had to do a lot of exclusions and things to kind of get this to work so i'm saying everything except the lights except the glass but this has essentially allowed me to assign my shaders so i'm assigning the default blue here and that's named after this so i've gone for a dollar os um, rather than hard coded in this this is my material path which is finding this material and assigning it to this correct piece of geometry here which i've declared in these variables in well these lops syntax i guess it would be called here um and then i go through and i assign some glass to the the glass area the, and this is a damaged version so you can see the smash glass and this is viewing the proxy in the viewport it's not viewing the final thing so you can always say final render and it'll switch to the final geometry you can see now you will have some smash glass and we're just assigning the glass shader here to that and then i'm basically grabbing the, the lights and I, I'm actually doing something a bit naughty and I'm just saying add the emissive texture, uh, the emissive shader, which is a constant material. So if I just go in here, it's this emit here. So you'll notice this is just a another digital asset that I've made, but hopefully it won't crash. But if we go inside, I am literally just signing a noise that animates over time and we can multiply that by speed so and it goes through a ramp so you get this kind of thing that moves over time so let me just explore this and this i'm bringing in the rest attribute here so that the 
And we, we created the REST position within the modeling department earlier. And then it's basically Material X, you have to kind of build up the, the controlling of noise. So you'll see that this noise does move. Probably not updating in my viewport. But trust me, it does move over time. And you can control the noise frequency and the noise speed just by creating parameters, multiplication parameters. <clears throat> and then you feed that into the noise function, which is the MTL fractal 3D. <clears throat> and then I'm just mapping that through color. <clears throat> now you may notice there is a Houdini icon here alongside the material X. That does mean that if you were to export this to Unreal or anywhere else like Blend, anywhere that X, that will support USD and Material X, this may not come across correctly. Uh, the Material X have not implemented this nice kind of traditional ramp thing yet. So if it has this Houdini icon next to it, it means side effects have helped and they've created a temporary node so you can just get on with stuff and I don't intend to put this into another program just yet, but I would have to be aware of that. Um, so nothing will break internally with Houdini, and I would imagine it'd still work when you export this, but the representation of this may be very strange. You may not have the ramp value there. In fact, you will probably be able to check this out when you export the USD right within Houdini and explore that and try to edit the materials here. You'll probably find that the ramp doesn't come through and it's just some weird value or slider or something. Um, so yeah, there is the emit node and these two are identical and I'm literally taking some of the geometry and I'm making that a material X, whoops, a material X surface on lit shader. And I'm just promoting the emissive, the emissive color. And I'm taking attributes from within the material properties here and promoting those so I can treat this as a light source and get better emissive end of contribution in the scene. The material X USD, I am just copying the value of the emissive value from within here. So it just, it just updates in the viewport, hopefully. So that's kind of what these two are. So I just have some control over the samples of the light specific to this model now and the shader limits that you can change here as well. You can kind of optimize things a little bit more as well. So you may notice I've not got the treat as light source in here, but I hopefully, hopefully I have actually, um, <laughs> it should be set to yes. <laughs> a little bit strange. That should be treating as a light source there. So I'm just going to apologies about that. Houdini did crash. Um, if you recall, I had forgotten to treat this as a light source, which is very important for emissive based shaders on geometry. I think it's going to be more efficient when it comes to rendering. So these uh, neon, uh, this neon and this LED are exactly the same setup. They're just a digital asset now with promoted attributes, um, which I'm assigning to the, the model. So let's just wait for the preview surface to kick in. There we go. Uh, and I'm assigning this on here and there is a glass shader over the top. So you might not actually see in the viewport I, I have had problems getting this to view correctly it seems to work on the engines which is the emit shader here so if i press s here you can see the um booster geometry so just highlight here you can see this booster geometry here this has the emit shader on there so i, I essentially go through and i assign everything i need and then I basically copy and pasted and renamed this, and then I created an, an equivalent material, copy and paste, copy and paste, and everything assigns. So once you've got one working, it's just a, a way of copying across. So it's not particularly complicated. It's just this part here, and then you 
had your two variants in here and these are the name of the variants but I'm intersecting here and I'm changing the variant name with this iteration of three times here so I'm basically doing this so it's well, it doesn't resolve, resolve properly but it would actually be default blue underscore zero one score zero two underscore zero three so I think that pretty much covers this now you may notice in the materials that I created wrap files now if I just pointed directly to the EXRs from within substance that I exported from substance painter Houdini when you first hit render would pause and it would do an auto conversion and it would convert that EXR to a wrap file because <clears throat> it's the random access texture is the more efficient way that Houdini would like to render with uh, so it does that under the hood but I prefer to convert everything once I've all once I've published my textures as the texture artist then I would convert them to rats so I would export one set of textures EXRs at so I'd create the exports for that particular material variant and they would all be 4k okay by default or whatever top resolution you want and then I would go through and this folder is where my shader is looking for um, material um, textures sorry so it's going in here and it's looking for the wrap files for each one and you'll notice that there are wraps for different resolutions the way I, I prefer to convert my wraps up front and then just have the shader do it this way because then there's just an instant returning when it, an instant response time for when you start rendering and there's no conversions going off and I can kind of control what Houdini is rendering I've had problems in the past where if it's an EXR it just keeps converting it to a rat and doing look dev can be a little bit um having to do all these stop and start the renderer and change all these different um configurations to kind of refresh and kick the renderer or just close Houdini and and there was a very good um, post on um, side effects about this some I can't remember the person but he did a very detailed explanation as to like how he refreshed it all and it is absolutely spot on because it took me a few hours to kind of do the same thing and then after very a very frustrating afternoon I went on to <laughs> went onto the odd force and there's a detailed explanation doing it so a little a little tip if you're ever struggling and you, it's taking more than half an hour do reach out to the communities that they're, they're incredible and um they, they will help you as well um so yeah i convert these to rats so you could do this many different ways i just created a script to do that so this is the script so essentially all i do and it's probably the worst python ever because yeah I essentially go to my folder directory here once I've exported everything um, so it would be this folder here and there'd be no wrap folder here and I would just select the top level and I would make sure that my path here I want the script to run over here and I want to take the resolution and I want to create resolutions for this here like so that will convert everything through in this given folder and it will create a wrap folder named correctly like so and then it will respect the subfolders and the names and then it will go through and it will create the um, resolution variations and they're all wrap files as well so that's that so i'll just hold that up so you can pause that if you want to take a look at that so this is why my um, shader is using rats for well, the material preview it's just using the axrs but i think the color space is a bit off because of that and i think i should have converted those to something a bit more efficient maybe png or something um but for now i just needed to know that hey i'm looking at the blue version looking at the red version i didn't really care about the viewport representation at this stage whoops So that that's pretty much it um and then i'm actually using the component out of the component builder here right, if you just watch carefully it'll load in yeah it's loaded in the yellow version so the reason it's done that is it sets the yellow version it sets the very last variant coming in 
and it'll be default yellow 03 so that'll be the 03 um, texture material variant I guess so here I'm using the to export this and just using this input primitives and then I'm basically creating a path to my structure uh, my database so this will export and I'm exporting some thumbnails with an XPU and I've set up on this side just a cheap um, HDRI and a little camera set up here which can you can do that right from within this node it's quite nice it will set up a little system for you and then you can add to it as well so I can create a thumbnail and whatever you see in the viewport right now will be the um, thumbnail that goes into this asset gallery so that'll do I just need to know it's the yellow version for now I'm not trying to get the world's most in thumbnail so we can now save this to disk I'm going to go ahead and save this and I'm going to create um, variant layers material variant layers So we'll go down and we'll just prepare. I'm just double checking everything is correct for me. And then I'll save this to disk. So this, as I'm running this right now, it's going to freeze my machine for a while, but it's essentially going to create a USD now in the location that I store all my USDs. So I have this kind of non-job specific USD library that's going to get bigger and bigger I think and I can then just ship this off to a, on a hard drive and give it to someone or um, just use this in a different project later on so it's going to go in here and then each department will author their USD again I'm just one person but I'm just trying to see how I could pass USD information back and forth rather than doing this completely in the component builder which Houdini um, chips with and you can actually do all of this under one component builder in one Houdini session and you might just be one person and you might prefer to do it that way and it's a totally valid way there's nothing wrong with that but you would have quite a lot of you'd have quite a big scene and I prefer to kind of have these isolated and structured Houdini sessions which are orientated around a department if you will and I export the USDs into the department folders so it's going to export the look dev folder it's creating the folder here and then a version and it's going to go ahead and it's going to localize all the input textures as well and it just dumps them in here so whatever I had loaded it's going to take the EXRs from the preview surface and put them in and then as it goes through the um, default blue one two three and the default is going to copy them and it's going to just take the given texture at this moment which is the 4k one so it doesn't ship any of the um, other resolutions because they're not really assigned or active in this in this variant set so we would have to set something up that would create a variant that you could select the resolutions as well which is not in this tutorial at the moment um, so that's going to go ahead and create the USD the textures and then it's going to give the thumbnails um, in here as well which we, we can then once they're complete can add to the asset um, library oh sorry the layout asset gallery so I'll be right back once this is done it should only take a minute or so okay I think that's finished um, saving the USD now so we can just take a look at the USD and here it is so if you recall we are in the asset aquabot and then we've offered the usd from the look dev into version one and then you have a payload and then you have the usd asset they have the variants so these are the variants that have been created and it's created a um, actually created the occlusion variant from the modeling department as well which we could potentially use but it's not really a look we want um, so there there you go so we can now go ahead to the layout asset gallery and I've created um, 
an empty database here that we're going to populate. So we can just take a look and we can just add this to the asset gallery and you'll see I don't want the occlusion one. So I'm just going to select them and hit delete. And you'll see now we've got a USD asset we can use in some of the other lops like the layout lop and things. So you could start to scatter these around or do what you like with them. So, yep. So th these are actually all different blue materials, the slightly different um, scratch uh, edge wear and things like that as well. So the thumbnails there and that's quite nice. So you get this. Kind of, so this is pretty much the setup. So. You know, it feels a little over complicated, but this is totally optional and the amount is totally optional. So it's up to you really how many of, you know, how many blue versions you want. But what I would recommend is having just to keep it easier is have the same um, iteration versions for each color. So three. So make sure you've got three on disk for each one or two, and then you can iterate through um, and you can get the three material variants the prop there are, there are many different ways of doing it but i that's kind of what i just needed it to just do some randomization later on so that's kind of like the a, a suggested way of doing the uh, random material variants so the next thing is i take this and then i create a little uh, like we did in modeling i do a little side by side look dev scene uh, and this is slightly updated to the one you saw in modeling and it's just another way of doing it but hopefully this has worked well i'll create a an asset reference so let me just pop, go back here yeah <clears throat> and you see this little line here it's because i've got this show for selected if i show for all um it'll show all of the relationships between each node which can look a bit like um very messy sometimes so i and when i open up a scene for that i've not opened for a while i tend to switch this on and just have a look and and quickly see that there is relationships between everything here but if you want to just have this active as you're working you can go for selected nodes so um it will just show you that this is kind of creating a link down here as well so bringing the asset the asset in using the asset reference node I'm not going to worry about the default variant at the moment. I'm just going to say that's the one I wanted, which is the very last one, default yellow 03. And that's because it was the the third input and the third iteration coming down this. So you could set this here and choose any, and that will actually do a variant selection for you right within here. I'm going to duplicate this. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the source primitive Equabot, which is before I go any further, it's this guy and it's equivalent to dragging this in here. Um, whoopsie. Dragging this in here is the same thing as writing the, the variable, I guess. Um, it's just so I don't have to mess around with it. And then I'm choosing to deactivate the source primitive. So when I actually duplicate this, it's going to, and I duplicate it two times, it's going to create Aquabot one and two, and they're directly on top of each other. I'm going to deactivate the source primitive and I've controlled the naming here by by default this is something like this which does that zero one and I didn't want that so I quickly just changed that and just got this zero one zero two it's totally optional so yep so all I'm doing with the duplicate is just the directly on top of each other right now and I could move them around here, but I'm not going to do that. And then I can set variants here so I can switch this to the red and you get the red variant. So again, the highlighting, let's turn that off. The, the red here um, feels a bit off the color compared to the actual render. If I render with no lights in my scene, Houdini will create a headlight from the camera and just render that. And this is the correct color. It's what we see in Substance Painter. But I've noticed the OpenGL is a little off. And I think, again, that's because I forgot to change, the, get the right color space settings for my USD preview, which, again, I don't care at the moment because if I change this to version red 2, it'll reload the 
preview surface and show me red 2 like the X Wing. And then red 3, there we go. Red 3 standing by. There he is. So he's a little, got a little bit more edge wear on there. Um, there you go. So you, at least you get some viewport feedback, which is quite nice. So I, I do the same here. I just basically create variants. So this is actually creating a, it's changing both. Yeah, remember there's two of them. So I can go ahead and talk about these later. I'll just deactivate them right now. And I'll talk about these later. So we can create a little scene here. If you remember, we have a little setup and this little bit different now. It's basically pushing one over this side and it's exactly the same as the modeling setup, but this time they're just kind of going down in this linear fashion and, and just a little bit easier. So they're just using the asset name underscore O2 to kind of take this dude and move him over here and take this dude, we need the highlighting, this dude and move him over there. So they will then spin around. So if I, why is that? And so if I move this, you'll see that. Um, I'm actually just going to move my timeline Alt P just to shift it to the, you can Alt P and it goes under your cursor like that. Then I, I always need more space for my details view and hierarchy view here, the scene graph tree. So I, I kind of like doing this and just like when I'm looking at the viewport, I like to scrub around like that. <laughs> um, so if I just go up again and the next thing we've not talked about this, but I have created a, another scene where I animate the, the engines a little bit. So you can't see that right now, but I'll just, I'll just move to the camera so we can probably see this. I have a camera and a light rig down here again. So you'll see that one of these engines, in fact, let's just do a flip book. It's going to be easier, I think. But one of these engines um, will be moving. Well, they'll both, they'll both be moving. So. so yeah, they're spinning around really quickly. And that was just procedural animation. So I've just kind of done it on the engine and the thingy here, whatever that is. <laughs> I have no idea when I was designing this. So just, um, yeah. So you see there's two different pieces of animation here, different speeds. And they've done that through a separate scene, which I'll talk of, I'll go over in a different video. But they're basically, I use a sub layer and I point to my animation. And this is the default um, model that I animated. So this is the one on the left. And then, and you can see I've got both here and I've just deactivated it and I'm doing the same here, but this time I'm bringing in the damaged version. Um, and this is ref, this is bringing in the damaged version for this guy. And it's just layering in some animation there. So if you don't want it, you can turn it off and it will turn off the animation and you won't get animation. So you can just layer in a little procedural animation just to give a bit more life to the look dev. It might actually be useful for kind of seeing parts of the texture that you haven't seen because they're obscured. Well, they're just hidden because they're not rotated around and stuff. So um, just a, a last minute option. So what else did we do? Oh, yeah. So when it comes to rendering, this will render and I'll just quickly jump through and you don't need anything as elaborate as this. You could just drop down a karma, karma node and it will let you just start rendering pretty much just declare a camera. <clears throat> I don't know if I've got that right. I've got some defaults in here. So, um, you should just be able to kind of render straight away without having ridiculously silly <laughs> OTL like me. So this is using motion blur and depth of field. So you'd have to configure this, but that's going to kind of render simply like that. So I had some presets set up, I think. So I actually had um, a little setup here, which would actually send this to a location. And I, I often change this, but I had this 
inherit the name of the render settings and the camera. So there's a little expression I wrote in here, which I don't use very often, but it might be useful for later on when you're doing lots of shots, you might want that. But also I was just wondering, how can I do it? So I, I dug through the, the, the help manual and found a bunch of variables and expressions and you can actually grab the name of the file can be the camera and the render settings. And you can even call it OS and would call this anything you want. Um, I'll update the file will be plot render cam. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but I'm not, I'm not using this moment. Um, I have a little kind of custom thing I built. Which I'll talk about in a second because it's changed since the previous um, modeling videos. Um, so again, I have the, the light rig coming in on the, on the right. Again, that's just a, a USD file and that kind of gets reading from my asset library here. So again, nothing fancy. I didn't go to town on the light rig just here. I actually keep my Houdini file there for that as well. So I can just kind of update it because it's going to become something a little more elaborate, I would imagine than just this. And then you could imagine this could all be converted into a subnet and you could make some really cool stuff, but I didn't really need to do that. So I've got a reference where I can call the like Beth and the color diffuse and chrome ball. And then the light rigs just rotate here. So they, again, they do the rotation after 100 frames. So, and I have three different light rigs. They can all render at the same time. So I can switch them all on and I can render one image and I can extract the um, beauty pass for each one. So if I switch on all of these, it's going to look quite strange. So, oh, this works. And the trick here is just to kind of create in the karma, just create the light tag, call it anything you want. So I'm just naming this after the light. So it's easier to find in compositing programs, I guess. So if I fire this render off now, it's going to look nuclear. It's going to be very bright, I would imagine. But because I've set up an AOV in my beauty pass here, um, and I'm splitting each component based on the LPE light tags, then it means that I can go through and grab the environment pass here, which is just exclude this one here. I can go ahead and grab the environment studio one, I think I grabbed, and then environment studio two. And you can see that there. Now you notice the emissive where it gets removed because it I think it treats when you do the light tags, I think it treats that as a like a separate like kind of light source. And these are lights are kind of textures and geometry emissive that are all flickering and doing their thing. And you can just add all this back up in compositing and you can choose which pass you want as well. So you can have a look dev template uh, going into uh, renders going into Nuke or Fusion and you can split out and have three different versions of lighting from one render, which is really, really awesome. Um, so you might have a standard set of, let me just turn this render off. You might have a standard set of IBLs or HDRIs that are all ACES calibrated that you always religiously use for certain things like fur or hard surface modeling and things. And you can just bring them in and this could be completely automated. You can pipeline this and you'll probably find in your studio, this is very pipelined and um, efficient, <laughs> but if you're just, um, doing this by yourself, this is one way of just breaking it down in a very, um, non-scripted and non pipeline way. Um, so what else did we do? So you may notice the variance. All I'm doing here is, is layering up the variance. So if I switch the blue one on the blue, um, USD preview material will be activated. And now we've, we've actually selected the blue, um, variant here just for preview sake, you know, so that's all I do. So what I do is I usually just select this and then I name this node, the name is the variant. So 
you may notice I am so I, I am controlling this on both of them separately so there's two entries here uh, there is asset one and asset two and I've just locked them because I don't need to change them and sometimes my middle mouse can change like a middle mousing up and down can do that and it catch me off guard so I tried to minimize that by locking some of these channels um, but this is looking at the blue and it's referencing down here as well so if you wanted you could totally do whatever you like you can break this channel um, and then oh there we are we have the default because it doesn't have a selection so it goes back to the default so you could then just change it to blue 02 and you'll see it's actually slightly different go to red one and you've got a little bit of a then table just viewing both of them so that's kind of cool so you can change this up and do what you like so we'll just go with the yellow so that's on by default but i could switch the yellow one on and switch the yellow two for example so it's just version two of both of these assets this here is controlling a shader so i'm using edit material properties and again i'm using the one for each so it's exactly the same and i'm grabbing that neon material so there is a neon material in the look dev in here and within here see if i can actually grab the right one there will be you'll be able to control the um i'm using the emissive i've promoted this and i'm controlling the emissive's color so if you go in here and you look at the one and i bypass this you will see you get the emission input changing and i'm using the emission color turning it to green and i'm making the light flicker a little bit just for so this is not actually going to get saved out this is just in the render so if i if i do not do this and i render you will get the um nuclear lighting so i'll just turn that off for now so we'll just go with one light while we're just testing this and you'll get the the random color that the random color that we assigned up here so this one here is kind of 02 so if we change this to variant of 03 I, it would just shift a little bit to be a different color um because it's built into this asset so that's 02 and that's 01 and you might that might be quite good for just having an asset which just randomizes like that and um, without you having to worry about it but you can also do it later on to later stage and then i'm taking this and i'm going yeah i want to control this to be red and green and i want them to flicker so but i'm not saving this out it's just going to be for fancy renders and just because we can <laughs> uh, why not um so yes yeah, so i'll talk about this now in more detail and the purpose of this node is just to kind of help it's a shortcut really uh, the idea is i drop this down i've saved a digital asset then i drop this down um let me just try that again And there it is combo rendering and it just gets dropped down so you can create your own assets and put your own shelves and all sorts your own sub um areas here to store digital assets so this is mine and by default it's loading in render cam one because that's the only one we have yeah this is the only render primitive render camera we have and then i choose the department that I'm going to be working in. So in this case, it's look dev. So that's just going to send it to any USDs and renders are going to go into the correct like department, like a folder within renders. So like, for example, in my project structure, all my renders go into the project that this is the project structure. All my renders go in here and then they go into 3D, not comp. So comp is if I'm rendering from anything to do with COPS or DaVinci Resolve, Fusion, Nuke or Natron, I put my renders in there. But when it's 3D, then if it was Blender, it would be here, but Houdini renders go in here and the department 
rendered it, it goes in there. So because we're rendering under look dev, it will go in here and you can see the folders being created here. And that's taken the name from this node. So my render folder is going to be called default blue and it'll be in there. So for example, you would see the name of the passes as well, like so, and a version. So I kind of keep it like this, really organized. And that's happening because of this node. So before we can render, and it's totally optional, what I like to do is I do a cache of the entire scene. So I kind of like flatten the cache down because you notice it's quite, quite slow to scrub through. So I will, again, this is just my preference for just very kind of a very small company, just me. <laughs> um, but I would basically just call this default blue because that's what I'm rendering at the moment. And then if I take this off, nothing happens. But if I plug this back in, and I save to disk. Well, that's going to do It's going to create a USD file. So I'm just going to come back up here out of my folder structure. Now, completely exclusive to my project. Um, sorry, let me just say back in the actual project in USDs, I've got, again, another department here. And because I've done this in LookDev, I'm going to have a scene cache authored in here, and it's going to be called default blue. So that's going to cache the whole thing. So I can now just detach that like so if I wanted, and then I could alt and drag this across and go default red and then change this. So this is a bit manual, this approach. Um, And it's probably not ideal, but that's going to create another folder if I cache this. It's not going to change the variant at this stage. I'd have to kind of come back up here and configure this to be the default red or one. But it's because I know that's kind of essentially this will kind of go through live and show me that. And then I can go ahead now and save to disk. And that's going to create the default red USD file. Like so. So I've got red, I mean, I've got blue and red. So we'll just get rid of yellow. That must have been from a previous thing. And that's the cache. So that's ready to render. So I can keep them plugged in. It doesn't matter. But just bear in mind when you turn them live, this will turn back to red. Uh, but if I load it, it's blue. So I can kind of just do this. And I can render these now. These are ready to go. So if I start to render these, they're going to render. Um, some render caches as well so I, I put all the render settings in in here so if i jump further down into here well before i before i go inside i'll just show you the top level so the the look dev hopefully that's become explanatory it's going in here so all my usd caches for my scene cache are here and then like render settings are going to go in there and it's totally optional to do this it just makes things a little bit more efficient we choose a resolution and a camera and we'll load, load this from disk so I can now choose to render either of these, I guess. And this is a local render set up here. So if I render to mplay, this will render to mplay and not save to disk. Um, and I can render specific frame range um, or the, the current frame. So if this works, it should just render the beauty pass to mplay with this resolution. So I can quickly just test this there we go so we get an mplay render with the studio and you can kind of test everything's working so i can see that i forgot to add the other studio um lights in there so <clears throat> that was a good job i tested that so i'm just going to reactivate these so, and then, yep, I'm going to have to regenerate, whoops, regenerate this. So you can see this is getting a little bit fiddly because we're having to remember to do this. So we could do this a little bit differently. So we could, we could start to do things like all the variant here. That.
Now it does give a warning about time varying variant selections are not supported by USD. Um, and I, I did consider setting this in a non-time dependent network, which would be here. But it, it seems to work and I probably need to, it's a warning, so I don't know how serious it is. Um, so if we set this to a live input, so it's just reading the blue and it's reading the red, you can recache these now and you can literally just go save to disk. And now we'll have the, the lights will be there and the actual scene cache is kind of updated into that version there. So both then will go through and cache. You could do a top graph if you wanted, but I don't really need to do that. I can just select them and hit render. So hit cache, save cache, I guess. So both of these will then set themselves to the um to the cache, to the read from cache. So we got the the nice cache thing here. And then all it is is just rename this to be the correct thing before you do that. So just keep that consistent. So we could even work out the the variant automatically and have that named as well if you wanted. But I'm just doing this for visibility right now. Um it's the 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 text is kind of annoying me a little bit. It's very useful, but I, I just wondered if there is a way to remove some of this um the text. Then we can probably hide some of these descriptions. Um and it should it should just help you not get things in the way um for now. And then if we go to maybe that's saved within the save the current desktop, maybe that'll save into the desktop. Try that later on. <clears throat> we can switch all that back on because um you might want to know certain things, but it'll just keep things a little bit tidier. All right, so <clears throat> we've cached the scenes and we don't actually need them connected anymore, but they can stay connected, but we can take them away if we want like this. And they are two unique scenes like so. So that's kind of what this caching part is for. And then the local renders, as I just demonstrated, I can go ahead now and just set this off to end play and I can choose um, if I want to view the beauty of the crypto mats, the occlusion, the utility, the asset ref. So you can make as many of these as you want. And that's because within inside this node, I have um, set up several LOP output networks like so. So here's the, um, the render coming through. And it's, there we go. So this has got, this is very flat looking because it's got all three environments so there's my this is lighting from my uh back garden so i took a hdri and then this is the environment studio and environment studio one and it's just in mid rotation probably or something like that so you get all the other passes so you get the emission so this is very low samples officially just so i take forever rendering but yeah so that kind of proves to me that that's all good that's just one frame and this drop down menu here is pretty much a switch node just being promoted into a menu which controls the switch node so i can kind of control this node and i can look at the different outputs as well um <clears throat> so yeah there's nothing fancy going in here if you know you can set the aovs like so so i like to create a separate aov node and then just pull in all the correct aovs that um will compile the when you bring the image back into a compositor like new core fusion and i'm using fusion studio because it's free and i actually own uh, davinci <clears throat> uh, davinci studio for doing my work i actually just use fusion for now but i prefer nuke <laughs> but um fusion's free right so once you purchase davinci and it's free anyway but if you want more advanced control you can purchase fusion so i'm bringing in the um the, the single render here once so it's bringing in the beauty pass here so you'll see here it's bringing in the beauty and i've got an alias here to like a shortcut as to where those should come from um and then what i actually do here is i 
the, the shuffle business is very different to Nuke, and if you're not familiar with Fusion, this might just seem really weird, and it, it is weird. It's like, it's not as good as Nuke, or even Natron, which is like free. If you've never heard of Natron, Natron's like a compositor, a free open source compositor that tries to copy Nuke, and they do a really good job. Um, and I used, <clears throat> I used, um, used the um, Natron for pretty much most of my bash comps that you see in my in my work here so i am just using i mean i used it around about or for things like this i just used that and i'm using natron to do all of this comp work like all of this just while i'm testing something and the backgrounds and compositing everything back on and that's free so like even all this is natron and i didn't know about fusion back then so um yeah so it's it's pretty much just when you want to do something like change images and things like that and this and that you can use natron and it's free but i'm not trying to just you know say don't use nuke please do um use any compositor you feel is right and i thought i'd give fusion a go um so my renders the beauty pass comes out and i have to like shuffle out all the different passes so I bring in the node here and then I use this this node which is the EXR read ultra node here which doesn't normally look like this when it starts off it's something like remove expression it's something like this and this allows you to read in a file and then shuffle out the channel um, well, I figured if I'm going to be constantly updating versions, I don't want to go through and do all of this. So I I use the Fusion Reactor to kind of get hold of these additional nodes. And this is like a repository that you can download and just basically get some really cool nodes. Um, and I'm using an expression which then just points back to this source file. So I do it on every single one. So it points back to this file here except I pull in the AOV or the studio so it's the same source file and so if I version this up to version 2 all of these update so that's the way so that's a little bit of setup time manual setup which is a bit time consuming um, but it's kind of probably worth it in Fusion if you wanted to do that the other way you could do it is you could use the script to do that so you can actually um, you can bring in a, a file and then right click to run a script on that <laughs> find it uh, oh yeah that's that's like script and you can do this or split exr and it'll go through the image and try to ex to extract all the exrs and then you can just select the ones you want and composite them but that extracts them to these reader nodes and then you have a job when you update to try and it kind of creates a one of these for like the albedo the diffuse the glut you know all the different aovs and then you've got all these independent files that you can't you have to you can't multi-select and change which is annoying you have to go through and change all the versions each time or kind of again create another go into reactor and find another one uh, another script to help you update all the selected nodes so you would have to go in and do another one which updates um the version and it's really quite clunky that that really did annoy me quite a lot i have got that set up but i don't need it because of this this way of working so i again i just sidetracking here but the actual expression i'm using <clears throat> is this guy here so i'm i'm just saying just give me the output of this file name source beauty which is this one and i call this source beauty and then it copies the input in here and then i'm saying show me the channel here which is the um or show me the aov which is this one and it's a bit dodgy this it's a bit clunky but it kind of works so I, I did the same for the occlusion and this kind of references that and then i just view the albedo and then i just do a a bit of a color correct to deepen that if i wanted that as a way of presenting that um and just add some fancy stuff here so um yeah so it's happy then i'm denoising this i'll talk about this in a bit more detail later on 
Um, so yeah, you can the AOVs. <laughs> they basically the the split per LPE tag will allow you to kind of have those different color channels all stored in one EXR file. The crypto map out is literally just that. Um, again, I am doing some stuff here where I'm experimenting with different crypto mats. I'm bringing the material and the objects. So if I I just jump up here and we'll try and bring this one again this this is just my workflow so it's just kind of showing you um why have i gone um there we go it's just showing you workflow it's not saying i'm not suggesting this is how it should be done um but i'm like on this side i'm doing the primitive kind i was trying to get some random um vars in here to kind of get the glow and stuff so if i switch this locally in my viewport to crypto mat out you'll see it switched and the stream updates to this so if you see inside when you change this the active line is solid so we will also see um it'll change here because i actually take the asset all of the assets and create a collection called assets and then to make the render quicker i hide the lights so i, I basically hide anything that's a type of light and then i've got something called fog here which is not used in this scene but if i create any kind of atmospheric or volumetric or anything that's i don't want in a crypto map i will put that into a collection called fog for example and that will hide that uh, and then that pinches off here down here with no lights then i create a prim var with all the lights and just create a value and then if i render this you'll see <clears throat> excuse me you'll see that the aovs is the crypto you can see the um component type subcomponents isn't really useful to me at the moment crypto material it looks wrong but it's actually correct because there's only one material on the entire ship and then the you'll notice the lights um, and the emissive lights they have a different material on them so you'll see that there are actually different crypto mats for the materials as well so you can see we had the neon lights and we had the led and we had the glass and um yeah so you'll you'll get that so you'll be able to see the you'll be able to isolate the materials if you need them and there's obviously the crypto map object to all the different objects as well, which is really cool for compositing and doing things like that. So let's jump back to that crypto object. So the other primvar, um, couldn't get this working at the moment, but this primvar was just kind of, I wanted to take the lights and just create a custom glow. So you'll see that. It's just creating a crypto map for the other lights. You you probably can see them there. So this this is like the back of the engines and the lights in there and stuff. So that, that's pretty cool for like compositing lens flares and stuff. Um, and that's kind of what I tried to do on this side here. This custom crypto map is I prune prune away everything and I just render the lights. So if we do that, it's totally optional, but it's just a nice way of maybe giving compositor a little bit more control over things but i don't really use this too much and that's essentially what that crypto mats um custom is there so it's not really uh, in fact we're viewing that so we should be viewing down here so if we change this to crypto mats custom it switches to that and then you've got the aovs the crypto mats so we've got things like this and we can create our own um prim bars which we can call anything we want and in this case i had an object id which was a red green and blue channel painted on the model this isn't actually in this particular example but if you had a color um, attribute three float color three vector color red green and blue and you called it this you would see them in this channel when it's rendered you would see them appear down here and then you can do another one here so it's a bit like the whole puzzle map for 
for Redshift, I guess that's kind of an old school way of doing it. So I, I just set that up so I could remember, <laughs> but it's not used at the moment. So you could have a very custom color on there or something which is quite useful sometimes. And yeah, this is the standard crypto mat stuff. So I have the standard stuff and then I have the custom AOVs and I like to layer them up because again, I like to create presets so I can drop one node down and create my presets for that. And then it's one less thing to remember when it's wrapped within a, an OTL or a digital asset like this. So it's pretty, pretty much what's happening here. And then the render settings, or a direct copy off of this one so it's consistent um, and then this particular pass here shares those render settings the occlusion pass um, it's kind of pulling in what we did in modeling if we wanted to do an occlusion render so if we switch this over again we're viewing the output here so if we we switch this up here you'll see that it switches to the occlusion pass and then hopefully this will update not broken anything and you get an occlusion render straight out the box and it's it's correct so but again this this is basically very it needs a lot more work because right now it's saying oh yeah i'm doing the occlusion for the yellow o2 and you may be doing red you know so you might want to promote this attribute up here somewhere so it's it's somewhere down here, so you've got something you can use. But it was I'm just experimenting with things at the moment, seeing how far I can, you know, pull data through a lot network from one USD to another. And so this would actually be the um default red underscore O one. And that will go ahead and find all those texture maps. And for the ambient occlusion, the height and the normal. And apply them so you'll have the correct um, ambient occlusion pass if you need if you need it. It's not essential, but again, in Fusion, when you're doing like presentations and stuff, you might want to just have that run as a separate pass. So, as you saw earlier in Fusion, I I kind of created the occlusion pass, and then I've also extracted the AOV pass as well. Um, so the denoiser here is working on this side but it's working here so i render without any denoising and then i go ahead and i i denoise but i rendered in at good enough settings you don't really see the denoiser but this is good because it just takes the albedo and the normal and then the beauty and it'll denoise that after the fact rather than you know user preference and then i've got a switch node to kind of switch between an ibl based occlusion render or an albedo one, I guess, um, sharpen, and I use some chromatic aberration just to kind of make it look nice. That then gets exported um, with an alpha, <clears throat> with an alpha channel. Um, so if you don't have an alpha channel, we'll have to kind of create one as well. So this has an alpha channel. This does not have an alpha channel. So probably just need to. I shuffle something across so we've got like a booleans operation here so i will get this so wrong um a shift yeah so that's pretty much going to give you the alpha an alpha channel for the um the albedo so we can just quickly switch that back here again sidetracking quite a bit here but you've got an alpha channel there and if you switch this you can have an alpha channel here as well and you can choose which one you want um, to export later on so you could export this to disk your correct format and stuff um so that's the occlusion pass. that's that's kind of what i was doing here so it's kind of i'm still in development but you know sharing is caring and maybe you've got some suggestions and um you can see how this works um utils I'm not rendering this very often, but it's essentially creating a render settings, which um, sets this to a um, CPU. I don't know why that was XPU. And that allows for me to take out the motion blur vectors 
and the UVs and the velocity. So these only seem to work with armor CPU. And then I've got another one here for just normals and position, which I already have anyway in the other over here. So, but I've, I've just done that. And again, I was just experimenting. I haven't really needed to use the utils very much. And then the actual ASIC reference is just bringing in the, it, right at the center, it's just bringing in the, the balls and the Macbeth. And I, I literally only render half my frame range here. So I think I do something where I have just half the samples and then for the frame range, I may just render half of that. Well, so I, I do something later on where I only render half. So essentially you have a bunch of things that you can switch to. Um, and you're doing local renders. So as you can see, we've got this kind of way of interacting locally with this bunch of nodes in here. So hopefully that should back. And we've got every single light on, if you remember. So we can quickly go back to our shot lighting. So it's time to send this to disk. So the way we're going to do that, let's expand that. Sorry about that. Um, is we've got this tops graph here, render all tasks. And again, you can see what I'm doing here is I'm pulling in all of these and I'm baking each one to a USD. So I'm kind of essentially taking the render settings and everything and just creating a USD file. So it then proceeds to render. And again, I've got an output file here, usually. So this output file is the same in every single entry here, but it's unique because of the dollar OS variable, which means I get a, a named render based on the input stage, I guess. So if I was to go up and choose which disk renders I want, I can say that I want the beauty, the crypto mats and the occlusion perhaps. Um, and as you can see, because they're toggled, when I just make sure I've got the right version and the right frame range I've got and the right camera and the right resolution, and that's all set in place. This is all dynamic and this doesn't get like saved. This is always be there. Um, you can, I mean, you could go to town and promote render settings and all sorts, but I just keep this unlocked. It's just a way of carrying data around, it can be a dangerous way to do it because if you update this node and someone updates this, they'll lose all their custom settings. But, you know, it's um, just me at the moment. So the, um, the disk render, you can just literally generate the static work items and it will show you exactly what is about to be rendered inside as well. Um, okay, so we've clicked on the generate static work items for both and nothing happens, but if you go inside and you look, you'll see that the work items for the, the beauty stream here and the crypto mats and the occlusion have been generated. So we can now go up and choose one to render. So we could right click and then essentially just put the output node and that's now rendering. Um, so my machine fans are going to kick in at any moment. And just to prove that that's rendering, you can see this is spinning around and it's now starting to um, generate the renders. So these are the actual renders here. So we'll let a few finish and I'll show you exactly where they go. Um, again, this is very unique to my setup, but it's just showing you the um, the structure that I have, how I've tried to keep a little bit organized when you're doing like maybe a freelance project or you're working independently. And um, did I just move something? <laughs> Have a look. So back in the job. So we're in the actual job here the renders go here so uh, the way i do this is i render either to a 2d or a 3d so anything from any of these programs goes in there and 
Houdini renders go in here and we're in the look dev department so it'll be cluttered in here at the moment because I've got some previous renders um, but we are looking for the default blue here and it's version oh we don't have a version oh yes we do sorry so it tells you the pass so these are the passes that have been generated and then it's going to go to version one and it started rendering it called beauty xpu again you can call this anything you want i just find it very um the only variable that needs to be changed in compositing then is obviously we'll have a different input here uh, probably from the previous renders they'll be different but the the input here it says input look dev aquabots look dev beauty xpu i don't have to change anything um <clears throat> but the the name of this is the name of the node here so this this name here is essentially what this would be called here so that's the way i find that in the fusion comp so the input look dev is just an alias you can create like a an alias here so i'll have like input lighting input modeling <clears throat> and i can write that in and it will shorthand it will take me straight to the render location for any of these paths here so i can kind of see who's rendered what from what department and why so there might just be asset presentations from each department we might be doing animation and tests and things so it's not shot based it's more like asset based at this stage um So that's going to render and we can take a look at let me just go back to houdini so it's done a couple of frames already of all three so i'm going to cancel that now because it doesn't really make sense okay we've cancelled the render and we can take a look at the um the results of those few frames and the location that they go to so if we just come over here in the project structure i've created here all my renders go in here so i have 3d program renders and 2d program renders so you have anything from these 2d programs in here uh this is natron i was mentioning earlier if you're not sure what that is check it out it's not a bad free little compositor um so we we are rendering 3d houdini and the departments are you know created here and we're in the look dev so we know that we're going to be rendering here so these these folder names are actually named after the, the karma render node here so default blue is where that goes there so when we take a look at that here's one i did earlier a few days ago with the damage yellow you'll see that it kind of gives you the passes that we specified so I just happened to render the same passes today as I did back then. I knew I was making this video. And then we can load this into this program called DJ View. Um, and you can take the top level sequence and you can just take a preview of this and see how this is working out for you. Um, now you notice this was rendered only with one I, uh, HDRI, which is the overcast one that I did, which is my garden um lighting from the garden but when i did the previous render i had all three uh so it, it's a bit difficult to review that so you'd have to take that into compositing and um split them out as well so we'll talk about that so the other one would be the um, occlusion which we did via the look dev as well so here it is so this is like another version of that as well so So yeah, and then you have the crypto mats, which are probably not going to look that interesting when we try to view those. You're just going to get two colors, but they're obviously channel specific. So let's just get rid of that. As I mentioned, today we rendered a few frames from the default blue, and it's the same structure again, so it keeps it organized. But you'll notice now it's like totally maxed out, and you can't view render passes in here. Um, as well just so you know that there is actually color space controls as well so i'm using i've got aces 1.2 and i'm i'm using the same configuration um that i use in houdini so that the renders look the same here that as they do if they're rendered 
into mplay as well so that there is that there so for this render or the previous renders i've done in the past i had to split them out so in fusion when i did these renders i actually rendered three uh, light rigs here like so and then i just choose to split them out like this And then I do a lot of comp work down here, which this is not a compositing video really, um, but it's just my way of going in and creating the, the turntables that I would use for, comp for compositing a presentation. And I usually just do my main comps and splitting here like so. So I do the occlusion pass here and I do the different channels here. So you would see like I have my textures here so let me just turn this off so it looks the same this is a color space this converts it to the correct color space but when you enable this you have to turn the color space um, view transform off otherwise you get a doubles visualization it doesn't save out incorrectly so this is where i'm rendering like overcast and then the studio and and i render these out with an alpha and they just go to davinci resolve and i just do a comp and do some fancy presentation so your clients could Potentially see the work. Um, yeah. And anything else that's specific to this? I'm not going to go too much in the comp. Um, so yeah, that's that. So essentially, what we should be able to do, and it probably won't work now I'm recording, but because we have a few frames of this default blue, which is this folder here. You should be able to just feed that into this source node here just make sure on the right frame it probably will crash because it's not as stable as nuke fusion and i think they need to improve this um but we should be able to take this here paste it and everything should be the same but it's just going to try and update um so it's updated the 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 source here with all the lights on and then you get the studio, the overcast, the albedo. Now this won't update um, because I'm just pointing to the probably to like some random place here at the moment, like modeling. Um, but you notice I've got the full path here, whereas uh, over here I've got this input look dev shortcut. And all that is is in Fusion you can go to preferences. And you can set these like you do in Houdini path maps. So you can kind of create import lighting modeling and you can create a, like a shorthand to the path. So this is just basically a shorthand in my project structure. So this is an internal variable. So comp semicolon will start the path exactly where your fusion comp is saved. And then it traverses up one, two. Right? So it basically <laughs> my my fusion comps are saved in this in here so it's like it'll go up one two and then it'll go and look inside of here and then renders 3d houdini modeling or in our case look dev so it's going to go back and look in 3d houdini dev like that so that's just a shorthand and that's why i've put that in there like so so it just keeps it a little bit more procedural so this is just the thing that you change in nuke this is way more easy and, and more you can have little node drop down menus and you can go mental in nuke uh but fusion's a bit limited oh it might just be my knowledge of fusion because i've only been using it since uh, well on and off really but i you know I've, I've made myself use it since january but i've been using it on and off for a while but i just got really frustrated when i first opened fusion because the layout was wrong and the nodes were all kind of going across <laughs> um, horizontal rather than vertical but you can actually with a bit of time you can kind of make this feel a bit more like nuke so do stick with it if you want to use fusion um <clears throat> and if you need any tips on it i would gladly make a video but i don't want to um digress into compositing at this stage um but the main purpose is that of this is just to kind of add a little bit of um 
denoise to the image because I render without the denoiser on, so I can denoise each one. Uh, you probably can't see that because I render quite high quality, you can't really tell. Um, but you can use the Odin denoiser um, just to kind of take off some of that noise if it's there in some of the. Well, I'm using this globally at the moment. Anyway, I'm just going to move back into Houdini. So that's kind of what this note does. So you could kind of right click and do the same thing and let this just load in the, there you go. So you've, you've got like a version of the red one here as well with some animation. So the whole point of this really is to, um, just to create a, a nice setup that you can quickly, and I can click alt and drag this across like so. And then I can pretty much just say, yeah, I want to render this one. I want to put it in a folder here, like so. And whoops. Convert this to the yellow one. And this should change to the yellow one. Should still get the camera. And then we can bake this down, like so. So this is not rendering, it's just baking the cache file. So we can disconnect it if we want. We don't have to really see any point of disconnecting it but well, I found that um, I could actually load that USD file in any scene and it would just like as a sub layer and it would just render this entire because I flattened the whole thing I can just render the whole thing which is really interesting um, so yeah so we've got the yellow version now so you will probably notice that we could start to render that as well so <clears throat> Again, totally optional way of working, just a suggestion really. Um, the main point was just to kind of get some variants quickly. So you can see um, it's a little bit of work up front, but now it's the return is very fast. And you could kind of combine this with a render farm and things like that and really, you know, or further embed this into tops graphs so it just renders everything for you. There's a lot you can do. Um, so I hope this gives you some ideas um, and I hope it's been useful. My apologies, I do babble on quite a while, um, quite often. So, <laughs> but um, yeah. All right. Thank you very much for watching.